Um, I never really thought about uselessness really ever because I never really thought that anything could be useless. I never, it never really entered uh, my vocabulary. I thought a lot about values. I think we don't think very much about what we value anymore. Uh, we are, when we talk about are we architects, I think it's a very good question. And um, maybe I'll just start to say why I started to think about uselessness or to uh, even consider it uh, something important as regards architecture. Maybe I will continue. So, as Jan said, uh, we, I teach in the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and I started there in 2008. And uh, so there are five platforms in the Academy of Fine Arts. We're a tiny architecture school uh, in a kind of a very, very big art school. It's like 1,200 students of art and less than 120 students of architecture. With uh, then five professors with the five platforms that you see. And these were all, uh, I came in at the beginning of this completely new idea, which was to teach design studio through all of the most important subjects. So there is analog and digital production, construction, material and technology, ecology, sustainability and conservation, geography, landscapes and cities, and history, theories and criticism. And what we were trying to do was to really uh, bring forward the idea that in architecture everything is important, and an idea of an interactivity, that there is no such thing as the idea of design professors and history professors and construction professors and people who teach this and that, and that we brought all of these subjects uh, to the center, and that everything is design and everything is construction, and everything is uh, part of the, the world we live in. So we wanted to make uh, this uh, school which tried make a difference in some way, a tiny school trying to make a difference, and it's also called Art and Architecture, so there's a very clear idea about some sort of intervention, perhaps. But I started thinking about uselessness uh, when I read this uh, bestseller that I'm sure all of you have read, this uh, Homo Deus, uh, the second uh, bestseller by the philosopher or historian Yuval Noah Harari, uh, an Israeli um, author, historian, and he wrote uh, in this book in Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, the idea that uh, with the coming of super intelligence or artificial intelligence, uh, that we would be, as a, as a society, we would be reduced into useless people and useful people. And uh, in the same way, Nick Bostrom, who was also uh, kind of on the same kind of profit uh, platform as Ivano Harari, he wrote this book called Super Intelligence, where he talked about uh, the idea about uh, being careful about artificial intelligence. The book is full of uh, algorithms and mathematical theories. Uh, but, you know, basically he wanted to talk about the dangers of making computers um, without teaching them our values. So we're back to the idea of values. So when I read these books, I went, wow, this is really amazing and really interesting and how to change the way I think and everything. And after about a week, I kind of woke up and said, hold on, this is... Um, this is really something that I got then actually the reverse reaction and became really angry about in my head because I realized that this idea is something that we are really also, I think, uh, suffering from. The idea that you have to choose one or the other. And I found it extremely, you know, the same way as we still read books as well as reading on computers. The idea, and, and this is a big, a big problem, I think, in today's society, is that you have to either be something or something else. And I find it extremely important to, to relearn, to believe, 
passionately in one side and her league passion just as passionately in the other side. And um, yeah, so that was uh, that was the reason I started to think about it and to react against it. And so I started uh, to look at, for example, simply what useless could mean in, of course, a very important idea is that you know uselessness is also or the idea of use being of use is something extremely capitalistic, uh, very much uh, with the idea of back to values, or worse, as, and we have to think about worth here in an idea of um, capitalistic worth, so it's a new concept. And here, for example, you, should, you can see that it says that it's not fulfilling or not expected to achieve the intended purpose or desired outcome. So a piece of useless knowledge. And of course, you know, if we were to think about that differently, the idea of basic science is we started to make research and found something which was not fulfilling or not expected to achieve the intended purpose or desired outcome. That doesn't mean that it's useless. It means we discovered something that we didn't intend to discover. And this is something that's really important to me, is that when you discover something that you didn't intend to discover, that is still a discovery. So this this is something I think you know we really have to think about again. So this idea of efficiency, employability, uh, having one, uh, just having one. This idea of that if you don't uh, achieve what you have set out to achieve, you have therefore become useless, rather than. For example, with the idea of basic science, that you go and you make something, you open your eyes to uh, other possibilities, and then you find other things that are perhaps more interesting than you started to look for. But of course, you know, if you want to think more clearly about that, that is exactly how the most important discoveries in the world actually happen. So, Uselessness and the idea of usefulness and uselessness, I personally feel, is a very, is is a very uh, reductive idea and, and 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 certainly very low on creativity. Um, sometimes something can be so spectacularly useless that it endures, and in endures, it can be reinvented. This. I'm sure you can have seen in many, for example, uh, older buildings, if we want to return it to architecture again, is that some architectures, some pieces of architecture have survived because no one has been interested in them, and they survived long enough until someone can rediscover them. The idea of being spectacularly useless I found particularly interesting. For example, when we see the ruins, this is a picture of the ruins of Palmyra in Syria. Not many of us have ever been to Syria. Not many of us will ever be to Syria. Not many of us have ever seen the ruins of Palmyra and before ISIS arrived. And not many of us will ever see the ruins of Palmyra when, after ISIS has left. But something affected us all when Palmyra was attacked by ISIS, we can't explain, and we can't explain the value of that Palmyra had to us, but there is something unexplainable, and this is also a really important part, I think, uh, that architecture has to play, is that we can express more with things that we make often, than things we can express uh, with words. For example, this, I don't know if you know this, uh, this archaeological site, which has recently been discovered, is uh, Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, and it's nearly uh, 12,000 uh, years old. It predates pottery and writing by 6,000 years, and archaeologists found none of the telltale signs of settlement. No cooking pots, no, no houses or trash pits, and none of the clay fertility figurines that litter nearby sites. There, they were hunters and gatherers and had not yet domesticated animals or plants, and they built uh, this uh, piece of architecture. So these massive carved stones were crafted and arranged 
by prehistoric people who had not yet developed metal, tools, or even pottery. These findings suggest a new theory of civilization. And um, so they said that scholars have long believed that only after people learn to farm and live in settled communities did they construct buildings of this scale. But Gobekli Tepe argues that it was the other way around. The extensive, coordinated effort to build the monoliths literally laid the groundwork for the development of complex societies. So we started to build, and then we built societies. And this is a really important way to think about architecture. Because usually architects, when we think about them today, we, we mirror what uh, society has, or we do what society has told us to do, and I think there's something essentially uh, compelling about the idea of making something and then building a society around the things that we make. So then, uh, after reading these elements and thinking about this a lot, of course I had to make a studio. So the first studio we made on this uh, idea was called, of course, Useless. It's the studio from the Worcester semester uh, 2017 where uh, I said, so much of what we value most has at one time or another been deemed useless. Indeed, it's the uselessness that permits them to be approached, acquired, reinvented, and remolded. Um, uh, an architect, uh, a Canadian architect called Ryan Steck, who's probably the only person I've uh, read about who uh, has written about the idea of useless architecture, has said that, the, so for example, the ruin is in some way architecture freed from the fetters, uh, freed from the chains of usefulness and employability. And only when it has been freed from this idea of efficiency, employability, usefulness, can it truly become a piece of architecture. Um, there are a lot of, there are some things that I keep uh, coming back to in studios. And uh, certainly one of those things is the work of Dr. Semper, who was a, and a really interesting uh, architect, one, of course, that he wrote and he built, uh, but he also was a migrant and a revolutionary. He wasn't someone who simply sat and waited in his office for things to happen and architecture to arrive to him. He was an activist, he got up and protested against things that he didn't agree with. When that became too hot, he moved to another country and migrated, and then apparently he was so hot-headed that he revolutionized something there. And so he spent most of his life migrating from place to place, being politically active, still, make a lot, still managing to make things we all know, like the Semper Opera in uh, Dresden, and for example, he, uh, this is the only surviving drawings of uh, the barricades he made uh, for one particular revolution in Germany. So there's also an ar architecture of the barricade, and Dr. Semper was one of the first people who thought about that. So the text that uh, Dr. Semper uh, wrote that we keep coming back to in the CMT studio is a text called The Four Elements of Architecture from 1851. And it's about uh, the idea of the wall sitter, where he argues that the domain of making the enclosure belongs to the weaver of mats and carpets. Even ornament is derived from the weaving and knotting of materials. Thus, too, center, the masonry wall was somewhat secondary and functional, dictated by a need which had nothing to do with the creation of enclosed space. The hanging carpets remained the true walls the invisible boundaries of space. This uh, picture is, uh, it comes from the uh, castle of Donna Fugata in Sicily, which is the castle also where they filmed uh, this famous film called The Leopard by this company. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, that film or read that uh, fantastic uh, novel, but you can see uh, there is this uh, really uh, wonderful embroidery on the walls, but if you look more closely where things have been pulled away, that the wall is actually a few inches behind this, so that the real walls here are hung in front. So, why, uh, 
So we started with Semper, we wanted to think about this idea of weaving. And at the same time, um, we looked, of course, at this building and we went to visit it. This is the Mannheim multi by Otto from the 1970s. Uh, and this, this building, which is, uh, was made with small pieces of wood, uh, five centimeters by five centimeters, and woven, uh, uh, woven uh, pieces of wood of five centimeters by five centimeters, actually manages to span, at its longest span, 18 meters, which uh, when we compare then this shell that you see here, actually compares itself to the, to the comparison of, uh, of, uh, the, of the size of an eggshell to the size of an egg. So it's an extremely thin, extremely light construction. It could happen only at a time in the 70s when uh, Germany had suddenly opened itself up uh, from uh, intense conservatism uh, to another idea about thinking about the world. Fry Otto uh, came in and filled that space with uh, these constructions which were uh, extremely light and, as uh, in his words, touched uh, the ground lightly. This was only intended to be a, con uh, a very uh, temporary structure, but, with, uh, but it still survived today. So with extremely little maintenance, it still survived today. Uh, in 2019, but its survival is very much uh, at stake. So you can see now it's being uh, propped up by these pieces, these crotches uh, to keep it uh, together. And the political uh, body in Mannheim want to get rid of it because they say it's useless. And so, of course, this had to be the center of our studio. They say it's useless because it's a new kind of space. Uh, because it will take time to find how to use it. And in a way, they say it's useless because they want to always find a use for it instead of allowing it to exist and allowing it to become a space that can be occupied continually. So, back to the idea then that of uselessness and the value. So, in a way, in order, and this is, I think, a real problem in society at the moment, is that it has to go because it is useless. And actually, those things don't correlate. So we started uh, the studio in that semester. We always start with a very quick, short exercise. And we thought, how do we start the studio? And we had to start with uh, material that very quickly is deemed useless, which is a newspaper print. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the, if you've ever heard the saying, today's news, tomorrow's fish and chips. <laughs> so, but it's great for making models because it's extremely, um, it's extremely malleable, it's made for going through these presses, and of course it's extremely abundant. And each, studio, uh, each student was asked to choose a type of weave, uh, so textile weave, so we're back to weaving and uh, semper and to be married, it, uh, married to it uh, for this semester. The end of the semester was uh, where we would enter a competition which was looking for um, some halls for a, for a sort of a, 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 a fair uh, outside of Vienna, two, three hours outside of Vienna. So each, this is the first week, the work of the first week, where each student uh, wove uh, three one-meter panels in, of the same weave in three different scales using a newspaper print. And so you can see this is the monk's cloth weave, which is usually used for linen. Uh, this is a denim uh, serge de lignum uh, print, where you can recognize uh, the pattern of your jeans. And this is the print, uh, this is the weave uh, for satin, where on one side it's very smooth, and on the other it's very, uh, it's, it's a little bit rougher. And these started to produce uh, these uh, pieces, so the students were asked to continue to work uh, with these pieces and to work with uh, uh, the newspaper, so they just developed methods with uh, folding newspaper, ironing it, and then started to roll it to create uh, pieces of practically rope, so someone developed a kind of a spinning wheel to newspaper. And, and they produced elements uh, which at some, uh, some points, for example here with this piece here, which uh, combines uh, flattened, uh, folded pieces of newspaper and the rolled pieces of newspaper, combines and makes pieces which um, 
I find extremely beautiful, but certainly still don't know what you could do with that. And, and this was something we wanted also to allow. They also, uh, the students created these pieces where they, each of them, uh, they portrayed each, each, each other uh, wearing uh, the pieces they had made. And then they were asked to uh, keep uh, working with these leaves and start to form uh, vessels. And uh, then uh, to look at the idea of working with very, very uh, thin materials. So we started with uh, this newspaper and then continued with an extremely thin plywood, which is a, has the smallest bending radius uh, possible. So I think it's just a one centimeter bending radius. So if you see this element here, this is actually plywood, which has been wo uh, woven with uh, what you call a kagome weave, which is a Jap Japanese uh, basket work. And so each of the students developed uh, these pieces. This is also a piece which is still using uh, the, um, uh, the, the newspaper but started to also look at the idea of uh, the honeybee, uh, the honeybee hive and the wasp hive to look at them, these pieces on different layers. So that we started then to create a possibility of weaving uh, wood and weaving architecture. And so I'm not going to go through all of the pieces, but what is uh, really quite interesting is that we uh, also went to visit um, the engineer who worked uh, with Shigeru Ban on uh, the Pompidou and Metz, which we also visited when we went to see uh, uh, the Manhattan multi -Hallet. And this is, for example, quite interestingly and in no way connected something that he assumes is going to be the future, the idea that wood can also uh, be woven. But in a way that goes against what I was saying because we don't intend to be useful. Um, and so these are just, these are some of the views of some of these pieces uh, that we created. Um, we started to look at uh, how you can actually pull parts of the structure and change how the structure reacts because when it's extremely light, it can do more than, uh, than uh, what, what you can do with much heavier construction. And you are completely freed from this problem of, the, of, of, of walls and the straight jacket of the right angle. Um, then I started to look at who has also talk, talked about that and when has usefulness or when has uselessness or usefulness reoccurred within society. And it also happened to, that we had this discussion with uh, William Morris, so the founder of the Arts and Crafts Movement. He wrote this essay called <coughs> Useful Work versus Useless Toy, where he, of course, thinks about the idea of making things uh, um, which are part of, uh, a part of your work of making things is also so it's not just to make it to make money, you make it to need to make it. To, for example, on the other side, the usefulness of useless knowledge, which is written by a scientist called Abraham Flexner, where he was, so this was uh, 19th uh, century. This was, the, both of them are the 19th century, so the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution when uh, the machine was started starting to become uh, important in uh, society and uh, where he also made a plea for the importance of basic science, so research for its own, for its own uh, <coughs> And then, uh, of course, Werner Herzog is just uh, the exception in everything where he wrote his book, The Conquest of the Useless, when, uh, for this famous film of Fitzcarraldo where they moved this ship uh, to the tropical forest. Uh, I'm sure you've all, or if you haven't seen the film, you should. So, when we made that studio, it wasn't over, obviously, and we continued then to think about this and said, uh, we have to invite some people to talk about this subject. And we, and also we wanted, we were a bit fed up of architecture lectures where architects stand up and say, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. And we wanted people to take something we had wrote and uh, react to it. So, and we called it, is uh, useless 
this uselessness mankind's most valuable tool, because we thought about the idea of the tool and the idea of uh, and going back to go back to Tefe. Tefe is that we first made things, and out of making things, we made societies. And so I just wanted to talk about some of the people we invited, uh, <coughs> because they were, I mean, not every lecture has been amazing, but some of them have been. Um, so one uh, was with Abru uh, Kerbach, who's a, an architect and artist. And I was first drawn to her work uh, with this, uh, with this um, exhibition called Effects, where she wrote that all people develop skills to survive in their particular physical, social, and cultural environments. However, when a person migrates, many of these skills seem useless and the receiving population translates this to lack of skill. So it seems useless, therefore you're unskilled. So these are things that we think that we that we bring together too fast. And so the exhibition call is called EFAT, so the opposite of infrequently answered questions. So displays knowledge and skills that have re of, from people that have recently migrated to Austria. So it shows things like milking a camel or cutting a watermelon, but she also is a feminist and she also uh, has developed an embroidered computer in her research into textiles and sewing and her thesis is that we could have developed a completely different digital world had the skills mainly attributed to women been given value. So if we had valued embroidery and sewing and, uh, and crochet, that perhaps uh, that we would have also invented another kind of digital world. And I think that's a really fascinating way of thinking. We also invited uh, Friedemann Schrenk, who's a foremost uh, German uh, paleoanthropologist. And he became very famous because he found uh, what you see here, a lower jaw on August the 11th, 1991. The bone scientific name is Ur501, and it was the geologically oldest proof of the genus Homa, or the first real person. And he gave this really wonderful lecture where he explained, because we always think that uh, man or woman or the human being uh, that we developed in evolution, things changed within our bodies, or the way we used our bodies, or our bodies changed because it was useful to us. And he said that was that is completely untrue. He said that evolution happened, things happened, and then sometimes we discovered them to be useful and then went on with it. And he, for example, uh, showed, uh, talked about one really interesting example, which was uh, that uh, he showed in the middle of the African continent that the savanna was this lush area covered in trees, and we spent all our time in the trees. And then it became much warmer, and the savanna reduced, and so you had the trees in the middle, and then you had lots of watery, rivery, wet areas, and then you have the desert, uh, but these watery, rivery, wet areas were full of fish. And he said then that, uh, uh, that if you look at ch chimpanzees in the zoo, if they, have, if they don't like the water, so that if they're forced to go into the water, they stand up. And if they have to stay in the water for a very long time, they will keep standing up. And so that, that's exactly what happened to us. We went into the water, we stood up, and then we stayed standing up. And at some point, we realized we could do something else with our hands. But we didn't stand up in order to use tools. So these are really important things uh, for us to think about. Owen Hathaway, who's... Uh, uh, an author of, and journalist started, he's uh, someone who has a very um, romantic idea of uh, communism and socialism, so you should really invite him, he's fantastic. He's, I'm a bit of a groupie. And he, um, he talked about the in-between spaces of post-war housing estates, so large open green areas which are traditionally treated as useless space, with no obvious programmed purpose, and what in those spaces is attractive and valuable, precisely of their lack of clear function. And he explained that, or maybe we, I think it's probably clear to all of you, is that 
Brit the British idea, people's idea of modernist architecture is very different to the idea uh, that people on the continent have of modernist architecture. So for example, Coventry was re, uh, completely newly built in the 1950s, but the British absolutely hate it. That same city, for example, in Brno or in Vienna would be hailed as an absolutely fabulous modernist city. So he also, he, he described bit by bit how a body politic can make people assume that a certain way of living and a certain type of architecture is useless, ugly, and, uh, and, and should be eliminated. So, you know, there's also this really it's what I want to keep talking about is that it's your concept of what has value. So, and then coming in the 29th of April, we have Kerstin Meyer, a political economist and activist who works in Berlin, Vienna, and Senegal. And she was present and involved in the rewriting of the laws in Berlin at the time of the fall of the wall where the laws in Berlin were much more about the mindshaft, much more about living together, and much more about the voice of the people having some weight. So she, with this knowledge that she gained, she actually formed uh, one of those five people who actually, I don't know if you're aware of the whole Tempelhof or Feld, the Tempelhof Park, which is a park now in Berlin. It's this enormous uh, space, which uh, used to be the place of the airport in Berlin. And it was a space which is, of course, uh, where the body politic wanted uh, to go straight onto that space and said, we can't use it as a park, we can't use it uh, for the people. And anyway, the people don't want it. And the idea, of course, was that they would, uh, that everyone needs housing and we're going to put lots of housing on it. It was an amazing campaign because with just five people against the whole of the rest of the uh, politicians, the only party that actually stayed with them uh, were the Greens, uh, where they were also smeared in the newspapers and everything, but they managed to put this to a public referendum, which was a really difficult public referendum, so not uh, the stupid public referendum of Brexit, where, uh, because you had to actually, even if people didn't attend the referendum, you had to get 50% of all people who could vote in Berlin. So not the people who voted, but it had to be 50% to get the majority of all the people who could vote for it. And no one believed it could happen. And I remember I made an article in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung with uh, a friend of mine who writes where we talked about uh, the importance of uh, this void or the luxury of the void. And uh, the comments after the article, because then it all goes online and you get all the trolls and everything, and all, all, all the articles were, oh yeah, they're lying down in Temple Hall and smoking joints or something, and they're just going completely crazy. So no one took it seriously. And then, to everyone's surprise, it won. So there was nearly 70% of the people who voted, voted for this, and over 50% of all people who could vote could do this. So there was something really amazing, and then something really amazing happened to them, that because everyone in the rest of Germany thought the Berlin people were just super um, spoiled and they don't know what to do, they won't even take this opportunity for housing. And then there was, and then suddenly people started to see that this was an amazing space and this was worth taking. So was, this is the same thing. So I wanted then to go back then to useless because at the end then of that lecture of, of that first studio. Some of the students said, but you have a hidden agenda in this studio. And I said, oh, right, well, I have a hidden agenda. And they said, yeah, useless also means use less, which is that you use less materials. And I hadn't thought of that, but then, of course, I took it and pretended that it was my idea, too. <laughs> and, um, and I said, yeah, great. And so, um, and I wanted to go back to that because it is actually part, I didn't do it on purpose there, but it has been part of what we've been thinking about in CMT, which is how do you continue to be an architect and continue to uh, propose projects in, in a society that has too much people, too much stuff, and too much buildings? 
is that you try and use much less materials. So uh, this was uh, also part of these ideas. And so a very strange thing happened is that people came to us from a city called St. Valentin in Austria and asked us to design and build prototypes for six bus stops. In a place which had very little structure, uh, it was extremely rich and had big, uh, absolutely you know, also big um, uh, industries. It was only an hour outside of Vienna but it didn't have any idea of the feeling of a city. It was very much a dormitory city. So what we first did was to go there and spend four days talking to people, putting our fingers to the wind, drawing things, asking people when the rubbish came, asking people who goes by this place, trying to discover things that you don't find out in maps. So trying to re-establish what could, uh, what could we possibly do there? And that workshop then provided the basis for this studio from the Whistler semester of 2016 called The Fabric of Place. So we're back to center and we're back to weaving, back to the idea. And so part of this idea is that we wanted to look at folding because folding allows you to make very, very thin structures with their because, of course, as you've seen in the first part of, of what you do in structures, is that folding a piece of paper makes it much stronger. And we used this book, which is really fabulous if you ever get a chance uh, to read it. It's a collection of uh, essays from uh, people of different uh, walks of life, mathematicians, physicists, artists, sociologists where it says folding is at work everywhere, it bends and weaves, it manifests and creates, it operates materially and materializes operationally. Nature and organic matter is modulated through and impregnated by folding. It seems to involve all scales from the largest as with inorganic geological folding processes to the smallest as with the DNA molecules. And so we started by folding paper and in the same way, each student had to take one folding method and start to look at it really, really closely. So we looked at it with uh, the simplest of uh, brown paper and looked at folding on many scales. But we had to be really fast this semester because this semester we had to not only uh, make uh, these experiments, we had to actually build something at one is to one. So we started then to say, uh, to, to really make uh, fast decisions. Uh, so we got uh, to midterms where the students actually at midterms had managed to make each of their, each had uh, continued with the folding ideas. They managed uh, to make uh, their pieces to folds that they were studying. So you can see these are a crumpled element, these elements in the volume. So made them on a very large scale. I think it was one meter by two meters. And uh, to make each student make uh, uh, sketches uh, for each of the six bus stations. So there was uh, six by 18, I don't know how many designs for these bus stations. So um, <coughs> they created then uh, these pieces that, uh, that we all looked at. And this, I just wanted to talk about this uh, uh, for a short time because then this was uh, the arrival at midterm, so midway through the semester. And at that time we had, um, and this is a really important thing also from what I was saying about the existence of two things beside each other that seem diametrically opposed but actually can work together. So for example, we in the CMT studio make a lot of things with our hands because uh, we're convinced that making with, you can make things that you can't express. And you can make things, for example, that you can't find in a computer. This doesn't mean though, that we're afraid of computers or we keep away from computers. What we're simply saying is that there's some things that computers can't do and that we can do and that we can work together. So, you know, because I really like to keep away from this is what we do and this is what computers can do. And I'm saying that too because in this semester it was really interesting we had as a visiting professor someone who's really uh, what you call one of the most important pro uh, proponents of the idea of developing algorithms to make for form 
uh, called Michael Hansmeier. This is the work uh, that he does with uh, 3D printers and algorithms. And we asked him when he did this work in the CMT platform here, when he was looking at these pieces at midtown, I said, what do you think now? Should we scan it in and start going further with computers? And he said, no, no, keep working with your hands, keep working with your hands. So it's, you know, it's a really important thing. Don't think as students that you've followed the digital path that you can't make things anymore, or if you make things that you can't work with. So it's all, uh, it can all work together. So we arrived then, we said, we kind of, with the students, we arrived then, at a design that we could uh, hope to build, and we, we arrived at this idea that we work with an idea of a, a sort of a zigzag fold with a crumple fold, so that the crumple, because we started, this beginning of crumpling was really quite fabulous when you see um, these elements here, because our uh, building engineer started to say, these are really interesting, and these are really becoming very, very strong, and that we could really work on this idea of the crumble and really push it a lot further to make extremely strong thin construction. So we settled on this basic idea and we developed then six uh, different uh, ideas, six uh, related uh, designs for these uh, pieces. Oh, I'm sorry, the other important thing and the connection then uh, to Semper is that this uh, the project with ultra high performance concrete and carbon uh, reinforcements. So we were able to make all of this with three centimeters thick concrete, so really, really thin uh, concrete. Uh, these are the designs. And then we started uh, to build uh, these large uh, pieces of formwork and lay uh, and, and start actually to uh, yeah, get it together and make it. So this is the development of the crumple part. And the really wonderful thing about that semester, apart from like this really crazy um, rhythm of uh, keeping, uh, working and making and everything, is that the students managed to find a way to work together. This is, I mean, we're part of a, we're part of a culture that can only work uh, by working together, but a lot of times in architecture school, we're encouraged to go off into our corner and hide our things from each other. But this uh, studio really, show just how working together can uh, really uh, make things much more interesting. So these are the students then, you know, make, mixing the concrete, applying it, everyone keeping it wet and doing it all by hand, which created then uh, these uh, really beautiful uh, pieces. You can see this crumple element that contains a seating area, a lot of, uh, the, the, the design is uh, really quite complex, I won't uh, go into it, but I can just show you. Yeah. This is so. <coughs> you can see these zigzags up here are where the zigzag rests. So it's a very simple construction. One uh, uh, rests upon the other. So um, that was uh, really great, and the city was really um, totally wrapped, and I thought, oh, this is great. And we thought, wow, amazing, we might actually get this uh, going. But then, of course, there was an enormous right-wing movement against this, and that completely killed it. And um, I don't know if I have to be proud or sad, but uh, the, the basic idea that reappeared everywhere was that it was too beautiful to be useful. <laughs> um, so it's still not dead as a project, but it's politically uh, at the moment uh, quite difficult uh, to put forward. Um, we then, uh, I mean, I'm just going through a few studios, I can't do through kind of 11 years, but maybe just some of the things that uh, we went through. I also think that architects should be politically active, and I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I think we should, 
try and invent projects for ourselves and also make projects that matter and make projects that can change things. We worked this uh, within studio, uh, uh, we worked also, I tried to do uh, some uh, projects also with other um, students from other schools, but not just architecture students. Uh, we also, uh, this is a, a project that we did with students of the liberal arts in Berlin, of which half of the students had been, are actually refugee students uh, from Syria who had got there on scholarships. So we had, uh, so this is a project which is about the idea of the architecture and of migration. And instead of making one project, we made three different projects, and there are three different projects about the idea of the continually moving exhibition or the continually moving and likeness of architecture. So instead of making some sort of climax at the end, we actually had three uh, projects, and each of those was actually an exhibition in a different uh, city. And we used also, uh, we started to also look at a way of presenting architecture in a much lighter way. We looked about, uh, for example, uh, the use of, uh, for example, nets and paper and cardboard. We looked about the idea of sewing uh, architecture. I just go to that in a point. We also, for example, got in trouble in the ECA, uh, in the academy. Um, we always get in trouble in CFT for different things. This was a political problem because we made a project which was uh, a problem that we have in the academy in Vienna where uh, you can only acquire for, um, to, for the art course if you arrive in person with your portfolio. So if you are from another country and you don't have much money or you need a visa, you can't come here and apply. So it means that this, this kind of automatic, automatic elimination of certain people who could apply to the academy. And the excuse has always been that they don't have enough room. This is the room that has not got enough room, and we make projects in this room, but it created an enormous uh, problem. <coughs> we also uh, worked then in Berlin with, uh, the, uh, with these students uh, from the liberal arts where we took their pieces of uh, artwork and sound works and uh, writings and performances and actually created pieces with, from contacts that I had with a company for this, um, that, because I had worked, made a project with this product, which is a quite uh, uh, flame-resistant uh, corrugated cardboard. And we created uh, pieces for, uh, for um, an exhibition in the monument uh, to the Berlin Wall. So kind of an interesting, kind of, it's a hard, very uh, um, inflexible building, and uh, we um, uh, worked together to make this with this very simple material. Um, then uh, we looked at this idea of kind of sewing uh, architecture, sewing and, and print, so looking at uh, how you present architecture in a different way, um, we looked at, for example, using textiles to make a more, um, a more uh, reactive and sensitive architecture. This is, I find quite fun, it's a, it's a sewn GIF, G-I-F, but anyway. So, uh, that was a, a trade softly, and then, of course, uh, I just wanted to uh, show you quickly uh, about uh, this book that we brought out in 2015 called Research Observe uh, Make where we looked at, uh, just to go through what we tried to, um, uh, what we tried to express with uh, that. Uh, so with research, we said that one tends to assume quite reasonably that the information given for a certain task is useful, but it often serves only to cripple ensuing propositions. And then with observe, uh, that Gustave Hubert once said that everything is interesting if you look at it for long enough. So the first, the first, um, um, the first view is not enough, you have to keep looking. And then let's make the idea of, again, coexistence, making and taking coexist, interact and enrich each other. Our hands allow us to discover what our minds cannot express. This is something we also learned about when we worked with 
the people from the Liberal Arts College because there was one professor who started to talk about elliptical thinking. A thinking, so we have a circular thinking which has one, one center and the idea of elliptical thinking where you can have two centers is that you can actually believe in seemingly opposed things just as much and at the same time. So, <laughs> just to uh, look at that uh, a little bit more closely, uh, we developed then for that book to kind of, in some way, perhaps make, uh, give a method to our madness. And, you know, when you try and make a book about a way of teaching, it's already a, a trap in itself, because if you try to explain it within a method, of course, the first thing you do once you've found the method is to break the method. So everything I show you here is, of course, things that can be continually uh, called into, uh, can be continually uh, questioned. But uh, I just wanted to show you one series uh, of different projects, short uh, examples of different projects that we made there. Uh, and this is uh, based, of course, on very uh, Wilhelm uh, Alexander von Humboldt, so the famous, uh, I'm working on a project uh, to show uh, the work uh, of uh, the Humboldt, the laboratory of the Humboldt University, which tries, and Humboldt is famous for being the scientist, apart from just being an unbelievable polygraph, who was the first scientist to make us, uh, to make it clear to us that everything is connected. From the tree on the hill, uh, to the folds of a geological um, map, to, uh, to uh, I don't know, a flower in the field. So this, uh, is, uh, this idea of interactivity is, um, of course, a, a modern idea because Humboldt arrived with it, but when Humboldt arrived with it, it was such a, an important and uh, clearly uh, expressed that he couldn't believe that, it, that he hadn't understood it before. Of course, we're looking at it in the idea of the Anthropocene. So we said four elements form the basis of weather and climate, temperature, pressure, wind, and moisture content. Changes are driven by the interrelationship of latitude, atmospheric circulation, ocean circulation, distribution of land and water and topographic barriers, and their revelation is at the core of these studios. So, we talk, there are, these are different studios, and I'm just going to show you short uh, examples of the different studios. This one is in major semesters 2012. So by the 19th century, almost everything in the natural world had been categorized, except the clouds. A method was eventually found by describing how they changed. And this ever-changing, complex interaction was explored and brought to visible form in architectural installations. And the idea was that we look at the world more closely by looking at how things change. And I found that a really interesting concept. And we spent a lot of the semester looking at clouds and trying to express how clouds behave and how, trying to express how clouds could be uh, a way of uh, understanding the world we live in uh, more closely because, and uh, that's been part of the work we've done, is that uh, we have become people who use technology and who use spaces, but we don't understand the spaces. And we tried to make projects which would help you to understand and therefore help you to modulate those spaces more efficiently or empower you to modulate. You know, we come into these places we don't know how to open the windows. If it's dark, we don't pull back the curtains, but we turn on the light. We start to, um, there is a philosopher called Owen Barfield who calls that dashboard knowledge. So it's the knowledge, you can go into your car and you know how to turn on, uh, you know how to turn on the car, but you don't know how the car works. And this is dangerous in buildings. And I think it's dangerous for architects to imagine that they make buildings where they don't actually understand where things work. And this, uh, for example, I just show you this one video called 110 Plants. So, the idea of this project uh, was that um, uh, it, it's very much re related to uh, uh, an artwork by Andrew Warhol called Silver Clouds from uh, 
uh, experiments of, in architecture from the 1960s. But what they did was to create uh, these uh, cubes of helium. So they brought up these cubes of helium and placed uh, one tiny piece of, of lead, which is it's called 110 grams because there's 110 grams of helium within this cubic element. And they uh, placed this tiny piece of lead on each of these cubes in order to stop the cube from turning around. And when you're within this room and you sit, these cubes then were allowed to float for three days during, during uh, the open days in Vienna at that year. And what happens is when you sit there for long enough, you start to realize where the air currents are, where it's hotter, where it's colder, and you start to realize through looking at how these cubes move through the space, exactly what the climate within this space is. So it's a, it's a way of understanding the or drawing the world around us in a different way, in a way that is much more um, inclusive for us. And so another uh, studio was called Gone with the Wind, where we explored the power of air movement and built also one-to-one -one <coughs> prototypes to using different aspects of air movement. And uh, for example, what we did was we went into a, a very famous space within the academy, uh, which is probably one of the most beautiful spaces I've ever experienced, which is <coughs> a building by Gottfried Semper, of course, which is the Semper Depot. It's this uh, triangular space which is extremely high. And we went uh, <coughs> with a scientist who um, was able uh, to, using centers, to actually help us to draw the space using wind movement. So this is, <coughs> we, we uh, rented two enormous, um, two enormous ventilators, and so they are the two enormous ventilators, and with uh, these whatever algorithms and things that I don't understand, we managed to make uh, this really wonderful drawing which is uh, the drawing of the space of the temperate depot with how the space works and how it moves, the, how the air moves within that space. Um, and so we started to make uh, different projects. This is uh, one of them called Exhausted, where the students uh, said, for example, this is also where we got into trouble, you'll see why in a minute. But um, they, they, made, uh, they made a survey of all of the um, air exhausts uh, within Vienna. So this is air that, warm air that is uh, lost and started to make a project of inflatable uh, constructions on these air exhausts. And you can see just how quickly something uh, can also be mounted. So within a few uh, seconds, uh, this uh, element, this is a 70 square meters uh, space, which is made then uh, with this uh, uh, with this inflatable structure which adapts uh, to the existing elements here, the trees and everything like that. It, um, it was in January, so in extremely high winds and uh, very, very cold uh, conditions. And so we had to be extremely careful, careful uh, to hold this uh, together. You can see they also uh, wrote, uh, used this as a sort of a manifesto about that. If you look, so this is the construction they started to discover. But they also talked about the wasted air and used it so that you could enter this, become warm in a space, but also talk about how this space is uh, then, uh, these spaces possible, uh, pop up spaces can happen in Vienna. But then you can see. <laughs> this happened with a, a strong wind, and this is, uh, uh, so we also got into trouble. <laughs> uh, uh, this is yeah, one of the, uh, often times we get into trouble because, so you can see, this is where it ended up, and we had to get the fire brigade to come and bring it down. And we're actually really lucky that, of course, that there was this paper we made. Um, this is also a very uh, complex structure that we made. So it's a it's an extremely it's it's it's, it's uh, an 
extremely beautiful structure, extremely complex, but made in that way. So back to this idea of dashboard knowledge. It's, it's a structure that seems to move with the wind of this room, but actually <coughs> what happens is that you come to this uh, construction, you would blow into a sensor. This sensor sends uh, the information to this wheel, which is connected to a tiny motor. This, this wheel is connected with these nylon strings to this first, uh, to this first uh, hexagon, which in itself is connected then to a second hexagon with another complex connection. And they themselves are connected to these strings. And it was uh, very much uh, a reflection of this idea of do I know how something works and my connection to the environment. Another then within this elemental interactivity is the studio called Interstitial Warming where uh, global warming, everyone is talking about it, it has already entered our core vocabulary. Local warming refers to changes in our near vicinity. And with warming on the interstitial level, we study the layers between the body and its constructive environment and seek to reveal their interrelationship. And how did we do that? We started with the first unit until midterm, where we looked at the tortoise and the turtle, because they're animals whose thermal comfort system is 10 times more efficient than that of humans and whose interaction with its environment takes place primarily through its hull. So each student reconstructed a particular one with special attention to the retraction and the emergence of the limbs. So everything that they reconstructed had to be able uh, to make this uh, movement. So the students went uh, to the Natural History Museum and they were able to choose uh, different uh, tortoises or turtles and it was up to them. Some of them uh, chose uh, very big ones like this green sea turtle. You can see that these are some of the way, and they all chose whatever way they wanted to make it. Uh, uh, here, for example, you can see how everything uh, can retract uh, with into this. So they created these extremely beautiful pieces and had uh, some people had chosen these elements which were one and a half meters long and to the complexity of making something on, 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 a, dirt, on a really, really tiny uh, And using this knowledge then, they were asked <coughs> to construct a one-to-one -to -one prototype which should generate a heat difference of 10 degrees, allow you to retreat into and emerge from it and have a developed circuit of five square meters and define a concept of comfort. Because, comfort. because studies consecrated to the definition of comfort suggest that it is as much a cultural phenomenon as a technical innovation. So I'll just show you some of the... So you can imagine this is an enormous amount of work to make this. <coughs> then, um, uh, and this is just, uh, this was a really interesting uh, a piece where they actually took the carapace of uh, the tortoise and actually divided the carapace, you know the, you know the pattern of the tortoise, so it divides into different pieces, and they actually created these balloons, which uh, were also covered in many layers, so there were six layer balloons, which were interconnected uh, by rope, so that this space could continually move and shift within the them. And then this is just uh, a kind of final video where they showed uh, they made the, uh, this costume for themselves. <laughs> so it wasn't a 
very graceful entrance into this and we fell into it. Um, and kind of the interesting thing was when we went there, we couldn't find her because she had managed, she had managed to hide within uh, the part. The part. I mean, this is just fun. But it was really interesting that she managed to hide within it. And then we realized afterwards why we couldn't find her anymore. And it was because actually when she jumped in, she ripped the whole costume off and she was naked inside. <laughs> so this um, uh, is another project called The Peripatetic Environment from 2014, where we looked at the idea of uh, what we think about how we work. So, uh, because one of the greatest changes in spatial thinking occurred in the 18th century with the emergence of the knowledge worker and the dominance of the city position. And the most advanced and fetishized piece of furniture today is arguably the office chair. And we posited that real creative efficiency derives from the polar opposite of city in a reduced spatial terrain. So, in abundant, loosely defined spaces of dynamic, dynamic interaction, Right. And so we started by pushing out all of the furniture, so we had absolutely no furniture at the beginning of the semester. And we had to begin either by standing and learning how to stand for a very long time, and uh, start to reconstruct how uh, we would build our space. So we started looking at our bodies, and we started looking about how we could um, construct ways of standing for longer, uh, for example, this student started to look at himself a bit, little bit like a crash dummy and started to find different positions for himself and, 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 and draw these possibilities for himself. <clears throat> and then we started to make these different ideas for constructions about how could I possibly fit. And of course, we didn't stay within. This is uh, only for midterms where we brought everything inside, but the idea was that you don't stay within the space allotted to you, but you move further. And we started to create these elements which actually started to occupy more space um, and also occupy space once you have left. Uh, this is a really interesting piece. They're actually quite light pieces and you can carry all of them with you in a sort of a continuous train. And there's a really lovely uh, way he worked uh, throughout the building of the academy. And the interesting thing is because he had so much of this stuff with him, you were new. You could be on another level, and you would see a piece of this uh, of, of his construction on the other level, even while he was at the top, because it was following him. It was kind of a, a slow motion uh, movement. And so the students started to look at how could I look at the building I'm in as a construction. So how can I hang from it? How can I connect to it? And um, yeah, and so we started to, uh, started to reoccupy that place. Um, but this is then is a studio we did in Sicily with artists from the uh, from the uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Bremen, and uh, we gave this uh, we gave this or I gave this um, I can't call it a brief, but I gave this um, framework which was uh, related to a, a play by Luigi Pirandello, which is actually the founding a piece of theatre of absurdist meta theatre, where the facts are there but ne nothing seems to make sense. And uh, we looked at this, it's called Six Characters in Search of an Altar after that play. And uh, so the students arrest, uh, addressed plastic and plastic waste agriculture, rural exodus, exodus, migration and tourism in contemporary Sicily. So we kind of focused on plastic and we started, for example, um, uh, we got a, a permit to go on to a beach which was actually a beach which is um, a protected beach, so it's actually cleaned all the time and we spent then two days cleaning that beach. And a really important fact is that uh, Sicily is the first uh, port of call since they stopped uh, the the port since they stopped the way for migrants through Turkey. Huh? So Europe paid Turkey so that migrants can't come to Turkey. So Sicily is the first port of call, and this region where we were is actually uh, that region which is closest uh, to Africa. And there was really strange things happening in the forums because uh, people were uh, uh, for equating. Uh, the arrival of an enormous amount of plastic waste 
with the arrival of refugees, which is a really worrying idea. So anyway, we spent a lot of time gathering this waste and gathering this plastic, and you know, we, we also entered it into databases and started to really look at plastic more clearly and look and really look at it as part of our society. It got to the point that we were looking for plastic everywhere and starting to find it as if someone else was finding a Roman coin or something. We started to look at it and really uh, look closely at it. We also visited, because uh, this is the this is a region in the southeast of Sicily where it's uh, actually the most intense greenhouse production in Italy, so 30% of the greenhouse production is there, and all of that plastic gets thrown away at the end of each uh, at the end of each season. So at each season, all of that plastic goes there, goes where? And we visited these farmers, and then we made an exhibition with our findings in Bremen, and uh, so we started to look, discover more. But this is a really beautiful uh, map. Um, made by one of the students where he took um, ideas of heat and movement that he uh, took from different digital sources and tried to explain it in a map. Uh, if you look even more closely, it gets more and more beautiful. But we were within this region, and if you look closely, up there, there's a fault. And that fault is a tectonic plate. And this part of uh, Sicily is actually in, on the African plate and the rest of Sicily is on the European plate. And so there's an enormous amount of movement between these two places, and that's why you have Mount Etna here, because there's just crazy movement uh, between these places. And very quickly, so one student really took this idea of rediscovering the idea that plastic is part of our society, it's developing, and he started to call them, rather than conglomerates, plasticlomerates, and started to develop a new thesis about looking about at plastic as a, as a, so when we talk about things that are found in nature, we usually think about organic things, but that plastic is becoming so much part of our society that it's also becoming found in nature. So all of the pieces you see here are pieces he found, and then he tried to recreate them with different experiments. Uh, this is also another student who started to make this idea of uh, putting things together, so with these with these uh, diagrams, so trying to explain different parts about the society of Sicily with these diagrams. I'm just going to move through this to now get to uh, the end. Maybe finish just with the last semester, <coughs> which is called a ball around the public building, uh, which was uh, <coughs> looking at the train station. So because of the way they are used. Train stations have always been perceived as public buildings. But in reality, they have almost always been privately owned. And when they were sold, the entire population spent the pain of their loss. And perhaps the strangest of the conditions of sale is that the site perimeter must be enclosed, something clearly at odds with the use of a public building. <clears throat> so we started, this is something that I perhaps forgot to mention, but we always are very often start with our materials. So we had very thin plywood or ultra high performance concrete. And this time we also started to look at something that actually no one ever looks at anymore because we think it's kind of boring, which is clay. And we started to uh, <coughs> say, started to say, what could we do with clay now? Because of course clay is pretty fantastic as a material. And actually uh, is, uh, because we all know now that concrete is killing us, you know, it's killing beaches, killing and societies, we just make too much of it, so we really have to look at other possibilities. And we haven't, uh, we have, didn't have any money, so we got Wienerberger to give us their, <coughs> their clay that we usually make bricks with. So it became a really physical thing because this is not like that nice clay you buy in the shop and you just cut it. You had to actually work it like crazy. So we really became a really chaotic, really dirty studio. There was dust everywhere. The students, you know, said, you know, at the end of these three months, it was the first time they had clean clothes on for a very long time. So there was just an enormous amount of muscle work to eventually get, so that was three hours of meeting to get to something you could use. And we started to then try and look at different possibilities for using uh, clay. 
And uh, it was with a site, uh, which was 65 minutes outside of Berlin, near a clay brickworks, and the students had to develop a way of making this wall using uh, different types of clay and start to develop, look at the possibilities uh, for clay. So we made models in brick, we made, this is the site, this is the train station, these are some of the models, uh, maybe just uh, to show some of these uh, experiments which I found particularly beautiful, where they had started <coughs> to look at mixing clay with fabric, so they started with jute and ended up with linen, and if you remember what we were looking at with uh, the concrete, you see that we discovered this crumple and the folds of fabric, and they started to use these crumpling and these folds to make it even more uh, <coughs> work even better to create these large pieces that could be connected. These are the, some of their experiments with weaving uh, these elements, and they found then that they could fire this, the linen would, uh, would just disappear, and you would be left with something uh, that could make these connections, that could drape itself around uh, different elements. And then also because of it burning away something within it, it also became even lighter. So there are lots of things that were really, really beautiful. This is also a really beautiful idea about looking at clay and mushrooms and self-destruction. Uh, and these are also, uh, a pro uh, this is also a project about digging and burrowing and using the holes in the furrows within an element in order to make it stronger. And uh, just to kind of finish with these uh, elements which we then rediscovered, because uh, these are of course these uh, Corotom things from Greenberger, and we had started even with the interstitial warming um, to look at what, what is the kind of surface of our body if it's a normal body, if it was developed, and we said that would be about one and a half square meters. And we um, said uh, then, uh, and then we said, oh look, what if we try and calculate uh, what the surface of this would be with its extrusion? And interestingly enough, if you calculate the surface of one of these coroton blocks, it's also about one and a half square meters. And once uh, the blocks fell down and that found also the dust, it left uh, really interesting. And just to finish there, I hope just to have the last, just to show then what that uh, produces from a, for a diploma uh, student. This is actually a student from Slovakia, Adam Kudek, who's just uh, finished his uh, diploma in, in, in the academy. So he started looking at uh, dust and dust in society and dust as, uh, uh, um, as part of our architecture and uh, created uh, these wonderful installations. Uh, I don't want to go into it any more, but perhaps finish with uh, a text about it. So the Roman poet Horace uh, from 65 BC wrote that we are but dust and shadow. Dust chambers are time-accelerating machines which foresee our futures through dust. They are interactive instruments which highlight the relationship between the human and non-human world. Exteriorized, uncontrolled, and invisible processes of motion, transformation, and contact are rendered perceptible by the naked eye in these devices. These chambers combine, separate, contain, release, and act as repositorial entities for the dust that could become the only collective trace we leave on Earth. Thank you.